Kim Fry is a co-founder and board member for Music Declares Emergency Canada, along with her daughter Bridget Fry from the indie rock band Housewife. Music Declares Emergency is a group of artists, music industry professionals, and organizations that are looking to create solidarity in declaring a climate and ecological emergency and demanding an immediate governmental response to preserve life on Earth. Kim has worked on energy efficiency and climate, but has spent a lot of her career as an elementary school teacher, a union activist, a staunch climate justice activist, and environmental campaigner. She's worked for a number of environmental organizations, which is part of the reason why she's found herself devising strategies for Music Declares Emergency, which is moving to get a seat at the policy table by using the specific capacities of music to move people. Our conversation covers a number of different things that we're both curious about in relation to these capacities, but we also dwell with the material problems associated with the music industry at a time of escalating climate emergencies. How does the music industry contribute to climate change, and what should be done to correct some of its impacts? Thinking in these terms helps us move beyond the tempting, but also fairly limiting, logic of condemning particular artists for their hypocrisy, their ostentatious lifestyles, etc., and into a conversation about the kind of music scenes and spaces of meaningful local music participation we'd like to see. What kinds of structural and infrastructural changes might have to be put in place for that to be realized? We're also concerned here with problems around genre. What kinds of music resonate, which tones seem out of touch with the complexity and urgency of the crisis created by an unaccountable fossil fuel industry and infrastructure. And we can't help but land on the fact that it's extremely complicated. There's undeniable power and influence in celebrity, and there's an inarguable concentration of power in a still quite monopolistic music industry. Transforming these things takes time that we do not have. The pace of change we need is maybe more like a metal song, but what we've got is kind of plaintive folk. It's not an easy problem to solve, this stuckness, but Kim encourages us to remember that the meaning of the word folk, it's meant to be the music of the people, just as pop is meant to be the music that is popular at a given time. This might give us an opening for thinking about the emergence of a new music nomenclature for conveying the climate breakdown that is coming if nothing stands in its way. Um, so I'm really curious to ask you in particular about the um, recent Climate Music Summit I want to know. Um, I know. I want to know about Music Declares Emergency as an organization, but it seems to me like these these e events can be what Ruth Gil R Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls focusing events, mm -hmm. where you know you gain a, a, a bit of traction by uh, holding these events. That's sort of why you do it. And I guess to start off, um, I'm particularly interested in the kind of keynote talk by David Suzuki, um, and. And what it is, I guess, about Suzuki as a figure in the Canadian climate struggle, the, the climate struggle in Canada, that matters. I mean, he has been for so long a kind of bridge for a lot of people to environmentalism. Mm -hmm. um, but you could say he hasn't really like pushed it in radical directions necessarily until maybe now where like moments um, have gone viral of Suzuki expressing his anger at inaction. So what was... During you know the keynote, what was Suzuki's sense of maybe the importance of music, anger, art, and trying to radicalize more people to take on the climate fight? Yeah, definitely. Great questions. And it's interesting for me as somebody who's really been reading um, Dr. Suzuki's books, watching his shows since I was in elementary school, and have seen him speak a number of times, in fact, covered it for the York University, one of the newspapers on York University campus in 1995. So I feel like I've in a way been witness to his radicalization over the last many decades. And where it might seem to some people like an abrupt turn, I've sort of seen it as like that ramping up. Um, and so because I think at his point in his life, and given everything he's seen, he doesn't hold back. And I think he's somebody who very much gets the urgency of the climate and ecological crisis and also profoundly understands the importance of the arts and particularly music in mobilizing people. He felt like the perfect person to have as our keynote. So we were over the moon delighted when he agreed to do it 
like almost instantly. There was no hesitation when we asked him. Mm -hmm. um, and he, you know, we were very aware it's difficult to get him to speak. And it was a pretty short turner, turnaround time for, so for us, it really signaled his understanding of the event we were holding, which was the first ever Canadian Music Climate Summit, and his desire to take his stature and his ability to say things that maybe other people would hold back on saying or try to say in a more delicate way. He's sort of of an age and has enough respect in Canada that he, he can just say what's on his mind without a filter. And we wanted that. So, and we were particularly inspired. A number of us on the organizing team had either seen the production that he did with um, Tara Cullis and Miriam Fernandez as part of the Luminato Festival um, called What You Won't Do for Love. And I, I didn't see it, but I read the book. And in it, they both discuss the important role of the arts. So, um, you know, as a species, humankind has really gone off on the wrong path. And I feel like for quite a long time, David has been talking about this sort of false sense of, oh, well, we need to balance the economy and ecology instead of seeing that the economy is a tiny piece within the ecology right it's not like these mm -hmm. two things on a scale but rather like ecological systems are the thing and the economy is a tiny piece of that um so i think i think the audience was quite profoundly moved by what he had to say and for us bringing together you know musicians and climate activists within the music sphere with some of the more Inst like bigger institutions within the music industry or the music sector. You know, we had people there from um, Sony Music Canada and Live Nation, um, Karis, which is the body that does the Juno Awards. We're all in the room. So to kind of have someone who could get everybody on the same page um, felt really like a powerful moment in the day. Yeah, no doubt. Um, and I, I get that, that you know, Suzuki now maybe has an understanding of the kind of ethical authority, I guess, that he has as an mm -hmm. elder, and he's interested in using that um, to challenge people and, and that he perhaps has like this, this deeper insight or, or around, you know, the ways in which capitalism is clearly this kind of externalizing machine. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to get to the kind of question of working with uh, corporate institutions like massive corporations and the kinds of, you know, strategic partnerships that you're interested in producing where, you know, there's maybe the ability to mutually influence one another's project. Um, but I guess I want to ask about how this festival, this, this moment, um, learn from, in a sense, failures of the past, like, you know, live earth, uh, happens in 2010, more recently, you've got um, this this failed, I mean, there's no other way to really put it, uh, climate festival that was supposed to take place during Climate Week in New York City, the big climate thing festival. Um, you know, there are things certainly that you, we kind of need to understand about the causes of those collapses. You know, I mean, Live Earth didn't particularly collapse, but it was carbon intensive. Um, but in the case of the big climate thing, I know you've you've got a sense uh, of sort of what the causes were. And I guess, you know, I'm rather than just like, I'm not interested in condemning people, but I'm curious to understand what the causality was. Was it just purely inflation? Because we are seeing a lot of concerts be canceled due to inflation. Or was it, you know, something that happened on the organizer's end, something that happened on the artist's end? Do you have any sense of what, you know, in particular Music Declares Emergency is trying to learn from, you know, these moments where things could have been done better. Yeah, you know, with the big climate thing, I'm still not totally aware of the exact reasons why it, it failed to take place. I mm -hmm. know when it was announced, I remember thinking, aha, that's like a very short timeline to pull off something very ambitious. And it just felt like a like a lot of really, really big name artists. Um and I was excited in terms of them bringing their influence and their audiences to come to, to think about, talk about, learn more about the climate crisis. But I think maybe it was just without scaling up um, too ambitious, particularly for this moment when 
the live music sector is struggling a lot of as you said like big concerts big festivals have had to pull the plug um you know even artists like Harry Styles have had to shift the way they tour and scale back in certain ways um just because of inflation and particularly the cost of traveling and hotels etc so Mm -hmm. we want we wanted to um, start small and do something that was proof of concept and just get some of the right people in the room we didn't need everybody in the room we didn't need to have a massive concert um, but we wanted to bring some of some of the people who hadn't talked to each other or aware of each other um, to understand the possibilities of scaling up and scaling up quickly to do work within the music sector around the climate emergency. You know, we said if we get 50 to 100 people in the room for our summit, that will that will be good. We had about 60, 65 for the daytime portion, and we had about 150, 160 uh, for the evening concert. Mm hmm obviously not mass scale, but it felt impactful and important. We had people from the Canada Council for the Arts and Ontario creates and the Ontario Arts Council. We're there to talk about the funding that's available for artists who want to make art and um, that reflects the climate crisis or take on projects. We had festivals that have done really innovative groundbreaking work, talk about what they've been doing. We had Uh, a panel of really fantastic artists during the day and again in the evening who have really deeply thought about the climate crisis and how it intersects in their work from different genres and different parts of Canada and people who weren't necessarily aware of one another and now are collaborating together. Um, And we had the whole thing filmed as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. So it will be coming out as a series of the panels, um, probably in the new year. And, uh, and there's a documentary now in the works that's also emerged from it. So for us, it was really about, we don't need everybody in the room. We just need some of the right people in the room to move this conversation forward. You know, we also had Live Nation there and some people questioned that decision. And for us, it was important because we are very aware that the biggest source of emissions within the music industry, is, within the live music industry particularly, is audience travel. And most of that travel is happening for very large scale concerts that happen um, at very large venues that Live Nation Canada tends to be the the presenter promoter for. So to not have them in the room would to not be addressing the, the biggest source of emissions and working with one of the largest players. And they were very keen and very cooperative. And we have a meeting with them to follow up on um, what we're doing. So, you know, I know in some, some ways they're, they're quite controversial and legitimately so, but we're trying to kind of focus on what can they do to leverage their power and influence. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and there's so much that um, I want to say in response to that. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's, first of all, just like, congratulations. It's like, it really is big. And in, in, in spite of it seeming small, like, I think, in fact, bigger, the notion that bigger is better is, an, is like an open mm-hmm. question. Right. There's clearly ways in which um, going big is, is, a, is a poor strategy. Obviously, you know, the climate crisis is a global emergency. However, it's it's becoming clear to me, like looking at um, the kinds of initiatives that exist, that so often um, local mobilization is more meaningful for a lot mm-hmm. of people um, in terms of the yeah transformative power of something like music. Uh, like there are these big, big songs and these big campaigns that don't connect necessarily because they're not written from a very place specific place. They're not about, you know, um, people's, they don't necessarily for me, uh, engender a sense of like agency because it's just this big, broad kind of bloated thing. Um, and, and to that, and I guess the thing I wanted to pick up on was this question of like big names, right? Mm -hmm. You talked about bringing big names in. There's a little bit of a double edged sword nature to the bringing in of big names. And I'm really curious about this, like balancing big names and the level of commitment that those big names have um, with, you know, your your core sense of what you're trying to achieve. I mean, there are pitfalls 
uh, of celebrity. Uh, look at the public indictment of someone like Wynn Butler. You know, mm-hmm. everything kind of falls apart when these these big big names become bad actors or or get exposed as bad actors. So I guess like, you know, I wondered if you could speak to how organizing events like the Climate Music Summit might mean sort of opening yourself up to critique by association where you see examples of organizations kind of negotiating that. And, and I guess like maybe more tactically, uh, if leveraging a celebrity is like always, always a risk, you could say, why even try it? You know, what are the Mm -hmm. kind of risks and rewards there? I think when you said leveraging a celebrity, I think that's the key piece. And there are certainly Mm. folks who are working um, in this realm of the intersection of music and climate who are only interested in working with very large internationally known artists, Mm -hmm. right? And they're like, that's the only thing that matters. Our audiences are so big. We waste our time if we're working with small people. And I would say Music Declares Emergency Canada and all of the chapters around the world are quite conscious and deliberate in our desire to balance working with bigger names who do have a very big platform and a very large audience with also shining the spotlight on smaller artists in different genres who might not be as well known but are making impactful music that addresses themes and are engaged in a very deep and committed way to climate activism and wanting to take what they're doing and use, you know, use some of our influence to shine a spotlight on it. Right. As -hmm. well as playing a role in bringing artists together to collaborate, to make new art. Um, So uh, when we think about like the breakdown of what we're doing, uh, uh, certainly we're very open and eager to work with large, you know, well-known artists, many of them, not just picking one or two. Um, And also working with artists at every stage of their career, emerging artists are just artists who might be well-established and well-known, but in a very, like in a smaller genre or more niche genre, Um, because it can't just be about having one or two or three people. And as you mentioned, you know, like if you're like, oh, well, we've got Arcade Fire. So there, we don't need anyone else because they're one of the biggest bands in the world. You you really expose yourself to risk. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's the only reason why you shouldn't put um, all your eggs in just one basket. I think there's many important um, ethical, uh, political, cultural reasons for working with a whole diversity of people and building a community um, of artists who care about this issue. And I think you know, in talking to some of the the artists who spoke on our panel, and we had um, Tamara Lindemann um, from the Weather Station, um, we had Sarah Harmer do a virtual address, and they all kind of say, I don't want to be known as the musician who talks about climate. I want it so common that so like dozens, hundreds, thousands of musicians are talking about the climate emergency because that's what we need to shift things, right? So there's no ownership or like, oh, that's so-and-so's issue. It needs to be everybody's issue. And I think that's a really conscious um, decision in the work that Music Declares Emergency Canada is engaged in. And if we're going to highlight and shine a spotlight on particular voices, it's not just who's most famous, but it's also like a commitment to the voices of Indigenous musicians and artists. So we, yeah, we really want to continue to like showcase voices that have historically been marginalized. Yeah. I love that connection between sort of genre multiplying voices and the cultural reasons for working with diverse artists. Like, um, you know, I think a lot about the songs about climate breakdown that um, resonate for me. And it's like, you know, songs like Anoni's four degrees, which, you know, when, Anoni compose, composes that song with Hudson Mo- Mohawk for COP21. She does so for the purpose of providing a different sort of voice. Cause like, I'm, you know, like we're aware that music for a very long time has been sort of obsessed with the, the sort of beauty of nature, perhaps even preserving nature. Um, but I'm interested in these kinds of voices that might, uh, you know, songs like this that 
really are about trying to provoke anger and action in response to the kind of climate defeatism that has become commonplace in a lot of places, I would say. Um, and, and, but at the same time, I wonder the scope of a specific song's impact and the effect of like anger and, 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 and the effect of genre. I mean, you know, in, in a, uh, earlier conversation, you mentioned this song I wasn't aware of by John K. Sampson called Vampire Al- Alberta Blues, um, which it speaks kind of both lyrically and musically in a language, a kind of, you know, musical language that is similar to Neil Young. It's evoking Neil Young. Um, that I would say is is more likely to communicate with communities that identify with the cultural markers of rock and roll, you know, whereas, you know, the hallucinations sort of electronic interpretation of the rhythmic power of powwow has more mass appeal, you could say, than something like Jeremy Dutcher's beautiful classical experiments with kind of reviving indigenous languages. So, but the idea is that there's room for all of these sorts of tonal landscapes and these musical languages. But at the same time, to what extent do you think about like um, how few people are going to care? Like, you know, the weather station, I, I think, you know, that album ignorance is, is sort of my, you know, it's my all time favorite as it were um, climate music record. I think it's just so beautifully realized, but it's not going to communicate with everybody. Um, something like winter sleeps America might, resonate with oil sands workers to like a greater extent than the weather station's ignorance does. Um, so how do you work through that specific question of genre? And are you sort of like an omnivore when it comes to music yourself? I do love pretty much every genre of music. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah, I can't think of a genre that I don't like. And I feel like I'm somebody who, um, both also loves and, and, adores the weather station and her record is one of my favorite records of the last 10 years um and i think it doesn't work for for everybody some Mm -hmm. you know my daughter um bridget fry who helped co-found music declares emergency canada and is a band in a band called housewife um she played at mariposa um at a musical workshop that was supposed to, to you know have songs and music that addressed ecological and climate themes there were some older people in the audience who had been involved in uh climate activism and we heard back from them that they were quite put off by the choices um of songs that my daughter's band chose and i was like oh that's so interesting because they decided mm. to do some covers they did bo burnham's that funny feeling they felt like that song gets at the despair <laughs> that totally. so many of their generation feel of when they think about the climate crisis. So for them, that's a climate song. But for mm-hmm. somebody who maybe has grown up listening to Joni Mitchell, Neil Young, and Pete Seeger, they were like, what is this song? It doesn't speak <laughs> to me. Um, I think people were like, well, this isn't a climate song. And mm-hmm. so I think there are people out there who have a very de- kind of narrow definition of what constitutes climate music or poli- even political music. And I think that when we start to to bring in lots of different genres and like, as you say, different kinds of music that are going to touch different communities and different demographics, we really need to kind of blow open the definition of what is political music, what um, what is music that's going to move and inspire people. And th- there's going to be music that touches on people's pain and sorrow maybe helps them through it or um kind of interrogates and pokes a little bit at the kind of overwhelm and desire to look away from what we're facing to to music maybe more in like punk and hip-hop or like riot girl that's like gonna touch in with some of the anger that people are feeling and yes i think there is a role for like anthemic music and even music that talks about the beauty of nature like it's all there but i think part of our job as an organization that works both in politics and the arts is to say there is no prescription really the role of an artist is to reflect on their own experience and do so in a musical way and that might resonate with some people and it might not resonate with people but but I think if you set out to be like I'm going to write a climate anthem a lot of times those that that music those projects kind of fall flat because they just Mm -hmm. seem too prescriptive and not authentic and not resonating from someone's experience. Absolutely. 
And I think that's why, um, you know, our plans for 2023 include having a number of songwriting uh, retreats or songwriting camps um, where we bring together a wide variety of different artists who will have some activations to get them maybe field trips or speakers to get them thinking about the climate crisis and then go and see what happens and what emerges. And there isn't going to be a prescription of it must look like this or sound like this. It's going to be like, you know, right. What comes to you? And I don't think there's any expectation that it's going to fit a particular box, but um, we want to help make more spaces just for artists to respond in whatever way works for them to the, the ecological and climate crisis. I really like a lot of what you're you're saying there in terms of trying to create this kind of like broad palette of different kinds of um, musical like interventions almost because mm -hmm. and, and that aren't sort of interventionists that aren't earnest or um, didactic. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, that's, that's the biggest trick, it seems. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you write songs that are still um, appealing, you know, aesthetically? And I think, you know, the example of Burnham's That Funny Feeling is so interesting, because that is a song that moves me deeply. I mean, there's, there's lyrics in that song that are really, really powerful. And I think it's partly because he tempers the earnestness with us with comedy to some extent mm -hmm. and it's disarming you know yeah. like and that's something that uh is is a subtle thing to try and understand and it, it it is not precisely anthemic use that term anthemic which i wanted to draw on to kind of ask this question about um an article that i think came out in um on npr's website by grayson uh, haver curran who talks about how like there might be a need for this kind of anthem this climate anthem, he, he writes that to this point, we do not have, quote, a song that helps us through our globally mounting anxiety about climate change, an actual anthem that propels people towards action. Um, and he sort of, you know, says there might be some candidates for this, this role of climate anthem, but most of these things are a little bit too maudlin or a little bit too like prescriptive. And he, you know, the things he, the thing he notes is he, you mentioned Joni Mitchell, right? Like um, that might be big yellow taxi, they pave paradise and put up a parking lot might be the track that he says comes as close as we've gotten to a, a unifying environmental ode. But mm -hmm. he says uh, it's, you know, notably more than 50 years old and feels quote as pat as an advertising jingle. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just an unfortunate reality of so much music that has stayed around for as long as that song has that it literally becomes an advertising jingle it literally gets used in advertising and it does get evacuated to some extent of its meaning. Um, but it sounds like what you're saying is, is on some level there's room for anthemic music, but maybe less room for this like goal of pursuing one anthem. Like for, for you, is that precisely like opposite the point of, of music declares emergency to have like one anthem? Yeah, I mean, we've certainly worked with a couple of songs that um, there's one song called The World on My Shoulders that became a bit of an anthem for the climate movement. Uh, there is an organization that put it, that uh, did the score and turned it into choral music. And part of our campaign um, in 20, this 2022 April, the Turn Up the Volume campaign, which is this big international music climate campaign where a lot of different organizations who do this work around the world kind of come together uh, and a bunch of different choirs did versions of that song and sent them in. And that, you know, that is a bit of an anthem. Not everyone likes it. Doesn't, you know, lots of musicians are like, Oh, I don't really like that song. Some people love it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there is a role for a song that lots of different people sing that you can get united around. We're, I wouldn't say that we're against that, but, I think what we're trying to do is create a very diverse ecosystem of music, right? Mm -hmm. So that uh, there are multiple songs, multiple projects that are touching on these themes and have music that will move people and understanding that different people are going to get moved by different kinds of music. And so mm -hmm. there's for sure a role for even like didactic music. Some people really like that. It's true. But it's to me, it's about not saying here's the one thing or here's here's what we're going to do. And we really struggled for our concert that we had the night of the 
climate summit, um, we wanted an opportunity for all the artists to come onto stage afterwards and sing a song together. Um, and we had back and forth. We actually talked, do we do Big Yellow Taxi? Do we do After the Gold Rush by Neil Young? Do we do a more contemporary song? And in the end, we just a cappella sang um, one of the more kind of chant songs of the climate movement so we could engage the whole audience in singing it. Mm. And it was Shakura Saida, who's one of the best known Canadian blues singers. She led everyone. She is a high priestess of music. And mm-hmm. it was it was like people were in tears. It was an event. It was just so beautiful. But it most certainly is you know, an activist chant, not a song in a typical way, but it was nonetheless very powerful. I, yeah, I've had experiences like that. I mentioned Jeremy Dutcher. He played as part of um, a tour that he, I think is still on a Canadian tour aimed at raising money for a uh, Wollastoge school in Fredericton. Mm-hmm. And he played here in Halifax, um, a free show at the library, right? Small scale. And it ended with a, a, a collective singing of we shall overcome the civil rights anthem um, and that was incredibly powerful because while mm. that song is this anthem, it is associated with a specific moment in history, you can breathe new life into those songs, especially if you have somebody like Dutcher um, leading that moment, you know? Um, it, it was, yeah, it was something that I think is, is you mentioned that it, it, it brings in activism. Like what it is, is like there, there are many people for whom, you know, entering into that space of politics is like unfamiliar or scary. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think music is, is to some extent, the sort of, you know, it's a path out of that protectedness that, you know, we, we often get sort of educated in, in some ways in, in like a liberal democracy where we associate politics, not with direct action, but with like voting every few years, you know, mm-hmm. um, it is a kind of, emotionally empowering thing like as um as bear witness from the hallucination says you know the rhythm makes you stand up a bit straighter um and that is power that feeling of of power isn't just a kind of masculine gendered notion of power it's it's more like the world is a crushing thing and you you know it encourages a, a degree of defeatism or the inevitability of fossil fuels in this instance but there are alternatives and part of it is just stepping into a belief that there are, are alternatives. You know, I wanted to ask a question about just like the tone. You've, you've gestured to this in terms of different genres of music, Riot Girl, punk, you know, pop, but each is associated, it seems to me, with different emotional intensities as well. Like folk music is, is often, it can be very serene and, and beautiful, but it also has lang- a language for despair, um, whereas pop music tends to be you know, people have talked about it's like kind of soundtrack for overconsumption, you know, just like tonight is the only night and like we need to have the most fun ever and blah, blah, blah. Where is, you know, where is there power in having a kind of, you know, maybe um, a, a song perhaps that like bridges different genres, you know, what, and, and I guess in terms of tone, what in music do you think is bridgeable and what might be a bridge too far for concert goers? Is it always about, you know, trying to appeal to diverse publics? Or do you think there is room for something that would be, you know, again, I guess I'm back to the question of the anthem, but really in terms of just Mm. tone and emotion, something that might communicate on a number of different registers. Yeah. Well, and it's always funny, right? When we start getting down to genres, because they Mm -hmm. they are a bit reductive. And I mean, folk music is just the music of the people, which people tend to have a um, conception that folk music is a singer songwriter with an acoustic guitar, but that's not really what folk music is. And similarly, pop music is just whatever music is popular. And folk music was the most popular music in the late fifties and early sixties, right? Yeah. That's what was like number one. So like it, it becomes a bit messy <laughs> when you mm-hmm. really start to think about these various categories. Um, and, but I think, you know, thinking about, and this is like very American focused, but thinking about how um, the Sanders video used the times they are changing um, when he was running for the nomination very powerfully. And then a whole bunch of different artists covered it. Like I think Jack White covered it and, you know, and it was very powerful and refreshing and moving to hear this song that historically was so important um, for you know, half a century in America have new life 
breathed into it by younger artists and a whole new generation embracing that music um, as they were supporting Bernie Sanders. Similarly, you know, I think it's kind of interesting that Taylor Swift, who, by the way, and I love her music, but happens to be one of the worst offenders when it comes to private jet usage. That's right. But nonetheless has a tour with a whole bunch of young women, many of them queer, opening for her who've been very vocal about climate. So maybe that will rub off on her, I'm hoping, Hmm. with this upcoming tour. But who's, you know, someone who as like the most popular artist on the planet stayed quite silent about her political affiliations until fairly recently and um, used sort of gave her song that she wrote about a lot of the mass shootings that were happening in America um, during the 2016 election in or 2018, I guess. Elect, no, which election was it? 2020 anyway she used it a few years mm-hmm. ago in uh the american election so she kind of gave that song and to me that was like an interesting signal of a very pop artist mm-hmm. whose song is she wrote motivated by something that was happening politically in the world and gave it to the democratic party because she'd been so silent for so long so i think there can be something very powerful when an artist like that can feel empowered to start speaking out but there will always be that pushback like we know that her whole team around her were trying to muzzle her for many many years before she felt empowered to push through that and when she did it did it did really have a strong impact in terms of a lot of her fans signing up and registering to vote and volunteering on campaigns etc so I feel like although the more critical part of me is quite resistant to the notion of the, you know, and critical of the whole cult of celebrity. And it's very dangerous as for all the reasons we talked about earlier, it can also be used in very meaningful ways. So sometimes it's about the real politic of like where we are in the world in this moment. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, a bridge too far in terms of music and genre. I don't know. Um, Mm -hmm. Like I think country music has started to not be the bastion of Republican conservatism that it was for so long. And I mean, still is to a large degree, a number of country artists are finding their voices politically and, and using them. And I think that's really important. And that's true in the U S as well as here in Canada, where um, we have uh you know, Leroy Stagger talking about climate, a number of artists in Alberta who are connected to Hinton and where the um, mountaintop removal is happening for coal mining are speaking Mm. out against that. And then it's starting them to to, to sort of think about climate issues more broadly and becoming more politicized. So I don't know. It's super interesting. Like, and this is the whole thing. It's like, we don't necessarily live in the world. We, We necessarily do not live in the world that we want to inhabit. And in part, it, it takes, as you say, this kind of real politic uh, or politics of compromise in which you have to kind of concede the fact that celebrity is, con- is a consequential like category of human being. Um, and that, yes, it, it, it's the case that, um, you know, Taylor Swift is is apparently the celebrity most responsible for like using private jets or, or the musician, the celebrity, you know, abusing these private jets to, you know, take her friends, I guess, all over the globe. But the thing that I um, am curious about is just this, you know, how that relates to um, the kind of invisibilized system effects um, of, you know, a very, you know, just broadly carbon intensive world. I mean, like it is the case that I think when moments like that go viral or, or just, you know, breakdowns of like Drake flying from Hamilton to Toronto and and the the amount of carbon expelled in this unnecessary, obviously unnecessary act of using a private jet. Like when those moments become public, become public knowledge, and there is this degree of outrage um, that something also gets kind of obscured. Um, Like this is something that I know you've talked about before is that like we need to understand that it's not always helpful to invest in this kind of moralistic denunciation Mm -hmm. um, and to shift how we look at uh, these things in terms of trying to put systems themselves um, 
in the hot seat, like, so to speak, it, it, systems themselves, you know, bec- becoming, you know, our object of scrutiny rather than Taylor Swift, yeah. you know, for what, all of her sins of using these private jets gets us to a different place politically. Right. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's tricky when we have be- been largely told for decades, really, that it falls to consumers mm-hmm. um, to educate themselves and to change their habits. Um, is this something that came out of the Climate Music Summit in terms of the the conversations people were having about, like, for example, decarbonizing the, the music industry? Yeah, we definitely talked about, like, who is missing, who needs to be in the room next time. And despite our very best efforts and a lot, a lot of meetings and energy put into reaching out to various ministries, um, the Canadian federal government um, and the Toronto municipal government, we just decided to not bother with the Mm -hmm. Doug Ford government, because we knew that wasn't going to really result in anything, um, that a lot of what we're talking about requires policy work and uh, political decision making, um, and is kind of a little bit out of the hands of the music industry, though the music industry has a role to play in maybe lobbying and pushing for these things. So for example, if you, like London, Ontario is a pretty big music market, And so is Hamilton, Ontario. You cannot get from Hamilton to London or London to Hamilton with public transit. There is no public transit connection between these two cities, which are two of the largest cities in Canada and only an hour and 20 minutes from one another. You have to go to Toronto to then go back to Hamilton. I didn't know that. There's no, there's no go link. There's no go link. There's no more Greyhound because Greyhound does not exist anymore in Canada. The Hmm. only thing that exists is a university bus between Western and McMaster. That's it. And it's private. Hmm. So this is, if we're thinking about music and and audiences moving and audience travel uh, uh, being the largest um, source of emissions, you can say, hey, audience, come to my show using public transit but there if there's no public transit that exists or like in nova scotia where you and i are there's no public transit for p audiences to come into halifax for a show if they're outside of hrm like it just doesn't exist Mm -hmm. so we need to then start having decisions like policy conversations creating projects and it's one of the the pieces that we're hoping to get funded this year for destination-based audience transportation demand management so how can we create an infrastructure for public ideally public transit and maybe in the interim non-profit um transit systems that will get audiences from where they are to large destinations and events and concerts so it's like in a way you can't then shame the audience because there is no way. Now, at the yeah. same time, we also, and this kind of goes back to our whole decision to not just focus on mega celebrity musicians, is ultimately too many people only spend their music budget and music money to go and see the less than 1%, you know, global mega stars. They're not going to smaller local venues that they can walk to or in their neighborhood or in their local town to see a local or regional musician or a smaller musician who's on tour across Canada in a minivan. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And so we're trying to figure out how we can uh, use our projects in terms of getting like a bus system for destination based audience travel that would have like a smaller emerging up and coming artists do a mini concert as part of that. So like, how do we mobilize the cult of celebrity to shine a light on other artists and kind of redistribute, redistribute some of the music wealth as it were. Mm -hmm. That is um, I think potentially really uh, materially uh, transformative in the sense that like, you're not just talking about communication at that point, you're talking about, yeah, changing infrastructure, Mm -hmm. what can be achieved using music as a means of like getting into the room and affecting policy. Um, yeah, that, that bridge is, is really important. I think it moves you out of this space of just pure greenwashing basically toward a paradigm shift where 
you know, like Dion Brand, uh, this is something that um, Robin Maynard and uh, Leanne Betta Samosaki Simpson write about in Rehearsals for a Living, is that, you know, Dion Brand has this notion of changing the air, that it's not just about like moments of uh, moments that make us feel good that progress is sort of being made, but actually trying to materially change the air that we breathe. Like we're literally talking about that being at stake in the current moment, um, both in terms of the amount of carbon in the air, uh, unprecedented, historically unprecedented levels, but also changing the air, maybe like emotionally, psychologically, which music has such an enormous impact on, um, where like the, the, I mean, the literature on the psychological impact of climate catastrophe really reinforces this point that many of us are just beside ourselves. Like we are struggling under economic and ecological duress. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are these chronic mental health impacts. So music that allows you to stand up a little bit sp- straighter and then also gets you into the room to you know talk about these material cha- changes um that could change the air um that to me is incredibly powerful um so i love you know I, I love music i love the music of climate breakdown because it does all of these things that i don't believe uh existing forms of like scientific and academic communication do mm-hmm. um but i won't you know i don't want to take too much more of your time the one thing i did want to ask about or sort of give you an opportunity to plug, I suppose, mm-hmm. is uh, your da- your daughter's band, uh, Bridget Fry's band, um, and her sense. I mean, you know, I know you've talked elsewhere about her sense of sort of the power of celebrity, um, you know, the the ways in which it can be used in specific ways, as you call it, this kind of cult of celebrity that exists that we can't deny <laughs> exists. Um, but I know too that uh, uh, she recently had to rename her band uh, for political reasons. And chose a really interesting one. I don't know if you wanted to speak to that or, or to what they're doing, um, but I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, yeah. So my daughter, Bridget Fry, um, is probably the reason why we have Music Declares Emergency Canada going. She really was kind of her idea and thought. And she's grown up in the climate movement. And when she was a little girl, like because I worked for Greenpeace and different environmental organizations and was involved in different initiatives, people would tap her, say, oh yeah, your daughter plays music. Can she bring her ukulele and sing a few songs at the rally? So she's sort of done that for a very long time Um, and started her project, which was known as Moscow Apartment. Um, it, It started in early 2017 and was a duo until very recently. Um, Uh, In April of this year, they changed their name from Moscow Apartment to Housewife. And it was largely precipitated by world events and people questioning their name in the context of Putin's war in Ukraine um, and wondering if they were taking a position or a side. And really, the, the name had nothing to do with that. So they they were told over and over again, they likely would not get played on American radio with that band name. Mm. Um, And so given that they were shifting their sound a little bit, et cetera, um, chose the name housewife as a bit of a tongue in cheek kind of feminist comment. And also this idea of like women and gender minorities, often being the ones who are kind of cleaning up (laughs) both literally (laughs) within a household but also like you know a comment on how disproportionately um feminized a lot of the environmental and climate labor is (laughs) um and also i think you know a lot of the bands that they happen to like in the genre that they're in there's a band called soccer mummy and there's a band called dream right. wife and there was actually recently a whole article on all these bands that have wife in their name that are all kind of like smash the patriarchy feminist bands mm-hmm. um so horse girl horse girl has a great album yeah this year. Horse, yeah. yeah so um there's like uh dad sports is another band that has <laughs> so there's like Anyway, these interesting. That's great, yeah. Names. So I think it was like a little bit of like that lane is a lane that they're in, but mm-hmm. also there's like the political sensibility around like the work of a housewife and kind of thinking about that on a global scale. And yeah, and the project is now just Bridget on her own. Um, her former bandmate decided to to step away from doing music for a while, and so I think Bridget's excited to do more explicit climate work. Um, 
now that it's it's her creative project and so um, I think there'll be more coming soon that might be a bit more explicit around the climate crisis. That's exciting. I mean, I've I've heard her speak about the uh, the project, and she speaks in really like pointed and and you know clear, forceful ways about the uh, the need for climate activism and a place for this kind of aesthetic education almost um, mm-hmm. that uh, music provides. So very cool. Um, yeah. Thanks so much uh, for doing this. Thanks so much for having me. And it's a great podcast and I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of it.